spoke my name then I saw his face yes I've seen his eternal glory I felt his hand when I was astray I never knew until then what his love truly meant I was lost but now well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Moore Park Presbyterian Church. How's everyone doing this morning? I'm glad you're here. And uh, for this morning, um, if you uh, are feeling lost in the middle of things because your kids are out of school for the summer and you're thinking to yourself, I don't know what to do with myself, well, hopefully they're signed up for vacation Bible school. Um, or they actually may be away at camp right now as well. So we've got 31 kids um, on Catalina Island. Um, some, some of those parents are like, I can't get a hold of them on the phone. And some of those parents are like, I can't get a hold of them on the phone. So whether you're the first or the second kind of parents, um, they're doing well. Uh, we've gotten a, a few words from them, and it sounds like they're having a great camp. So, um, But I'll tell you more about that in a little bit. So let's begin our time together in worship uh, with a word of prayer. Would you pray with me? Uh, Lord God, we are so thankful and grateful that we have a place to worship in this morning. Um, we're so thankful that uh, you're taking care of part of our flock that is on an island off the coast of California and pray that you would bless them. And that you are here in your home with those who are not able to be with us this morning, who may not be feeling well, who are watching us online. Um, God, we're thankful that you're everywhere. You're with us all the time. And Regardless of whether or not we're thinking about you, you're thinking about us. And so as we worship the risen Christ this morning, would you help us to do that in a way that we're completely focused on you and we're able to leave the distractions of the world behind? We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand. Sing together.
many people actually knew that song? I've heard that before. That's a new one. Okay. It, we um, want to find traditional hymns, and we feel like sometimes we can sing the traditional hymns, the three or four that we know, like over and over again. So we're always trying to attempt to go back to some of the hymns maybe we don't know as well. So that was an attempt at doing that, and it completely failed. But we're going to, you know, um, no, it didn't. It didn't. No, no, it, I, no, no, no. It's it, making it an old hymn new uh, is what we're um, trying to do, and bring it back to our memory and realize there's such richness in the hymns, and so it's great for us to sing them. This is, that's way too much clapping, way too much thank you. I know you like my shirt, but yeah, let's keep it. Um, no, this is a chance for you to get to know the people who are around you. I know that there's new people in the room. If they don't feel welcome, um, then that's your fault, so don't make that your fault. Um, make them feel welcome. Everyone just say hello to somebody who's around you, okay? Now I'm going to give it to back to you. Aware of a few things that are happening in the life of the church, and so you've really made those people feel welcome. That's great. This is the pad of friendship. Um, it doesn't do any good unless you say something in it, right? So uh, this keeps gives us an idea if you're here or not, gives us an idea of ways that we can pray for you. If your address or phone number, any of those things have changed, you can let us know on this as well. But that's at the end of the row. If you take it, you pass it. It's also that place where you get to cheat and realize, I just asked the person's name next to me what her name was, and I can't remember, but she just wrote it down. And now I can look at it as the friendship pad goes by and I can be more friendly in the future, right? And if you're really smart, what you do is you take out your phone and you take a picture of the name and then you have a picture of that name on your phone. Now, it's not that you're going to write down their social security number or anything like that. That's not what we're about here. So there you go. We're handing you there. Good. Um, this is a picture of our kids uh, yesterday at camp. Uh, actually, it's not a camp. This is in front of the church. Um, that's the whole crew. And so um, what are you praying for when you pray for them? Um, one, um, probably maybe if, if you have a, a grumpy leader, everything for the whole group is just bad, right? Sean has a really difficult time sleeping unless he's in his own bed. And so pray for Sean and his sleep uh, over the next couple of um, days, um, for sure, and rest, the rest of the leaders as well, but Sean as well. And pray that these kids get to know each other really well, but they get to know Jesus really well as well. So pray for them. Uh, that's them. A um, couple of their kids, a couple of our kids. It's, it's great. Um, so pray for them. Uh, and we're going to pray for them in a little bit. Family. First family camp out and breakfast here at Moore Park Presbyterian Church. This happens on the 21st of July um, through the 22nd. So it's overnight. It's $20 per family. And so you are going to be here. We're going to have a place where kids can ride bikes. We're going to roast marshmallows. We're going to actually sent up, set up tents and camp. And it's going to be great until the police come and say it's illegal for us to stay overnight on campus. Um, but... 
Hopefully that doesn't happen. Um, but then we actually are going to fold in the next morning. Um, we're, they're doing the Joel Birchfield breakfast the next morning. And so our whole group is kind of going to join the Joel Birchfield breakfast the next morning. We'll get a chance to hear a little bit about um, the foundation and other things that are going on with them. And then they actually take a walk from here down to the Joel Birchfield bridge. And they do some things down there as well. And if you want to be a part of that, you can do that. Or you may realize your kids haven't slept all night. And it's a good idea at the point that they've had breakfast to probably just go home. But that's, you know, that's your own wisdom and discernment. You have to figure those things out. Our annual golf tournament is happening on the 2nd of October. We only have a couple of foursomes left. That's totally a marketing ploy. We have plenty open, but I'd like you to sign up sooner rather than later. Um, and so that, those registrations are available online right now. Um, we do um, the 3rd of July is when we celebrate the 4th of July here in Park because that's the founding of the city. That's why we don't the third, and it's a lot cheaper to get the fireworks the day before, if we're totally honest. But we as a church then the next day show up, and we're able to clean up all of the, uh, the park that's there. And so if you would like to volunteer to do that, um, where do they meet for that? They meet at the park? There's a meeting at the park, but if you go online, sign up also, so they'll be there. Perfect. So sign up online and meet at the park, and you've got all the information you need there. Man, these... These announcements just keep going. The 2nd of July, that's next Sunday, we have a congregational meeting. It'll be brief. It'll be after the service. Um, and if you, can, if you want to, you can stick around and help us set up um, for Vacation Bible School. Um, but that congregational meeting is going to do two things. One, it's, it's a, a little bit of an awkward moment for me because if my compensation package changes, it actually has to, that change has to go before the congregation, and the congregation has to vote on that. And so there's been uh, a movement from session to give me a little bit of a raise, and so um, please be here, and if you're not in favor of that, then you don't have to be here next week. No, no. Um, but I have to tell you what's on the agenda for the congregational meeting. So there's that piece of information for a part of the congregational meeting, and then the other is that the denomination has set forth a policy, which is to say that part of my terms of call, my agreement for having employment here, has to include something about family leave. And so they're going to add something on to my terms of call, which will add in a place where um, I get family leave, which means we can have a whole lot more kids. No, um, it's, um, <laughs> it's not going to happen. My wife's eyes got as big as I've ever seen my wife's eyes. Uh, no, it actually can be used for a number of different things, but it's, it's more of a policy-shaping uh, thing that we have to do at that congregational meeting next Sunday after the service is happening. Um, and, and the last thing, this is a little bit of an, of an awkward thing, but I want to be forthright in the way that we deal with things here at the church. And the last couple of Sundays, we've had some visitors um, at the front of our church um, beggars, panhandlers, uh, people in need, um, however you want to sort of uh, kind of ca characterize uh, where they are. And so people would say, well, did you, are you helping them? Are you doing something for them? And, and I want to um, make you aware that when we have something like that happen on campus, we approach folks and we say, we'd love you to come to church with us, right? If church service is taking place, we're always going to invite them to church. We're always going to be kind. And then the second is to say, it looks like you're in a place of need. How can we be helpful towards you, right? And then most of the time what we're going to do is we're going to give them a list of resources and we're going to send them down to More Park Pantry Plus. And you're like, well, that sounds like we're sort of outsourcing, right? If we're talking about someone's housing needs, their food needs, all those kinds of things, we're just not equipped as a church, as small as we are, to be able to do all those things, but we have a great relationship with More Park Pantry Plus, where if they walk in, in their office hours, they're able to give them lots of different things that we just don't have access to. So we're trying to put them in touch with the right people, we're trying to do the right thing, and so my request of you would be, and this sounds like it's unbelievably cruel, but it's actually, it actually is smart for us, right? Don't, don't give them money, because if you give them money... Number one, we don't know where that money's spent, if we're completely honest. And maybe it goes towards the right things, but maybe it doesn't. The other thing that happens is if all of you give them money every week, we're going to have more and more and more people of need, and we're not actually getting at the heart of what their need is. We're just throwing money at the problem, which I don't think is what we want to be as a church. We want to holistically walk alongside of a family like the, like the family that's been here and sort of say, how can we help you? Beyond just giving you a dollar or two, how can we help you find housing? How can we help you get the right kind of nutritious food? How can we make sure that your kids get into the right school system? Whatever it might be, we want to have that kind of approach as opposed to, here's a dollar, please don't bother me. 
And so it really is a good stewardship thing for you not to give them money because either they're going to lean into the help that we might be able to offer them as church, or they're going to say, well, they're not giving me money. I'm going to go someplace else and try to find my money someplace else, which is fine. Does that, does that make sense? And, and, and it was kind of a place of like, we shouldn't talk about that in church. It's like, I want to be really transparent about what we're trying to do. And, and to be recognized that it is not a cruel thing to say, hey, we're, we're going to let the church sort of step into a place of trying to be the point of contact to be helpful towards you so that you can get the best help possible. And if you're just here to grab money, probably not the way that's going to go down. That's not the transaction we're trying to make. Okay? Good. Debbie, you're going to lead us in prayer, I hope. Does that sound right? Oh, good. She's coming, so she's going to pray. Will you pray with me? Father God, we love you, Lord, the creator of this amazing universe and the creator of each one of us. Your creativity and your faithfulness are beyond our comprehension. Your care, compassion, and grace are limitless. We confess we fall short of your expectations. We fail to spend time with you, get to know you better. We act before we ask for your direction. We do what we want, and then we ask for your help later. Forgive us. We put so much useless stuff before you. Help us be more mindful of your presence. Help us, Lord, remember to call on you first in all situations, to spend time with you so we know your direction for our lives. We often come to you with our laundry list of prayers, not waiting to listen for your word or your will. Help us become more aware of your will and your presence in everything we do. Lord, we continue to pray for the Ukraine and Russia. Please bring your peace to that part of the world. We pray for our middle school and high school kids who are either going to camp or are there now. Keep them safe. Speak to their hearts and their minds. Bless the volunteer leaders, Lord, who, keep, um, who are going with them. We ask for your patience, your wisdom, your peace, your strength, and your protection as they help our kids know you more. For the children who are participating in VBS, we ask that you bless each one of them and their families. Give them open minds and hearts to hear about you and the endless possibilities you are so capable of. For Ms. Cammie and all the volunteers for VBS, give us the tools we need to manage each child every day. Allow your spirit to fall mightily on this church always, Lord, but especially for that week. And I pray that it be a week of fun and wonder for all. We lift up your church, Lord. Thank you for the leaders of MPC, for the faithful congregation, and for the path that you have set us on over these past 30 plus years. Continue to give the leaders, session, and staff wisdom and direction as we continue to grow in our community and in our faith. Lord, we pray for those suffering loss, the loss of a family relation, the loss of a family member, the loss of a job, the loss of good health, finances, all the situations we find ourselves in because we live in this fallen world. Cover us with your loving wings, Lord. Give us a sense of peace because you are aware of each and every circumstance, even when we don't like the outcome. And you know what, you, we, you know what you're doing and you haven't forgotten any of your children. The battle has already been won because of your death on the cross. And now let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught of his disciples by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right, I invite you to stand. you're not good 
good enough when he told you you're not right when he told you you're not strong enough to put up a good fight when he told you you're not worthy when he told you you're not loved when he told you you're not beautiful to never be enough oh fear he is a liar he will take your this time in the service that we um, provide an opportunity for our offering to be taken. Um, and uh, she doesn't know I'm going to tell the story, but uh, yesterday, uh, Hadley, my daughter, got kind of a first big paycheck. And, um, and, and, and it, was kind of a, it was kind of a fun moment, right? And then I realized, like, gosh, we haven't had any conversations really about um, tithing to the church. And I'm like, but I'm, I'm kind of like, I said, this is going to be a weird conversation, honey, but like, 
I, I know it, it looks like it's self-serving, and it, and it is, um, <laughs> but, but the conversation was, if you start this habit now, this habit will last a lifetime, and someday you'll look back and realize it's a good thing that you have to be sacrificial in the way that you give. And she said, um, can we watch a TV show now? No, that's not what she said. That's not what she said. Um, but it, but it's, if we're not doing that ourselves, it's a really hard thing to tell our kids about as well. And so uh, why do we do offering? Because um, the, the church needs the money. No, it's because we're connected to our money so powerfully that God wants to kind of take us away from that place of being connected to it and saying, it's not my money anyways, it's God's. And part of the way we do that is we sacrificially give to the church. So you have an opportunity. There's um, a couple of plates in the back. You can do it online. You can do it in an envelope. However it is that you feel called to do that. But if over the next few seconds here, we just take a moment in the service for you to reflect on all the good things that God has done for you and realize none of this is mine. It's all his. Now what does it mean to give it back to him with my time, with my treasure, with my talents? Let's take a moment to reflect. I invite you to stand. Miss our kids for Children's Church. Miss Cammie and her team are in the back. <laughs> I invite you to stay standing. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me All my days I am held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God
Good morning. I'll be reading a scripture from 1 John 4. It reads, And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God, and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us, so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear, because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. This is a new song. But you'll have another chance to sing it if you need to listen just for a little bit. Sick and tired of being sick and tired. Had as much as I can take. I'm so done, so over being. I've gone through the motions, I've been back and forth. I know that you're thinking you've heard this before. I don't know how to say it, so I'm just gonna say it. talking with Cynthia and, and um, Joss this morning. We were talking about me not wearing shoes. 
and I was totally afraid to not wear shoes, but I'm so comfortable, and yet you can, you can take a picture of my feet. And Josh said, everybody here loves you, Bonnie, so it's okay. So I'm, I'm just going on that. If you don't love me, don't say anything, because you're, you're definitely going to hurt my feelings. Once upon a time, there was this man, his name was Alexander Graham Bell, and he invented a thing called the telephone. Like, how many of you remember the telephone? Well, if you're too young to remember what it was, let me tell you. It was this object, it could be on a table, but most often in the days when I was growing up, it would be on the wall, and it had this thing, it was called a receiver, and you'd pick up the receiver, and you'd say hello to whoever was on the other end. There was no caller ID, you couldn't block unwanted callers, so your heart beat rapidly, kind of like mine is doing right now. It would beat really rapidly because you didn't know who was on the other end, ever. Like, there was no picture, no words. The flood of adrenaline and fear as you pondered, oh my gosh, who's there? What do they want from me? It was like you were in some sort of a, well, like the pivotal moment of in a horror story. You know, a movie, a horror movie. I was like watching, what was I watching yesterday? I was watching The Ring. I've never seen that before, but it involved the phone ringing and them not knowing who was on the other end, but a supposing who was on the other end. That reminded me of, of what I was doing, but man, I'm, a, I'm surprised that I'm even alive today after all of those scary telephone calls growing up. You know, we can be afraid sometimes of the dumbest things. We can be afraid of senseless things. And, and that includes being afraid of people and places and things. And we're afraid a lot of the time of God's call for us as a church. So I'm here today to tell you that it's time to break up. And it's time for us to break up with fear. And there are many fears that we deal with in our everyday lives. Like Keenan said last week, there's health and there's finances, there's death, there's the unknown, just to name a few of the big ones. But the biggest fear that we face as the body of Christ, the big church, big C church, is the fear of change. Now Keenan talked last week on a more individual level of letting go of fear and trusting God to lead us in the direction that he needs us to go and where he will be with us and uphold us. And I'm gonna add, keep us from danger. And that's what we need to look at as the big church, big C. And so today I wanna to take a look at um, Gideon and how he had to change his life from one of fear to one of obedience. So our scripture, I'm going to ask you to stand. We're going to read our scripture together. It comes from Judges 6. This way, when I mess up the words, you mess them up too, and Donnie doesn't blame me. Let's read it together. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abiziite. Son Gideon was threshing wheat in the winepress to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied. But if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. My friends, this is the word of the Lord. Uh, let's go ahead and pray before we dive into our scripture. Lord, we thank you that you have called us here together today. 
your body of Christ. We ask that you illuminate your word and the message given that it dwells deep in the heart of all who hear it and that these be your words to your people, not mine. And it is in your son's name that we pray. Amen. Gideon was afraid, clearly. But he wasn't afraid of the unknown like many of us can be. He was afraid of what he knew and was witnessing on a daily basis. You see, the Midianite army was enormous compared to the Israelites. More than 300,000 men. And they were slowly starving the Israelites to death. So what does God do? He calls Gideon out to save Israel. And then Gideon becomes even more afraid. And he makes his fear clear to God. He's from the weakest family. And in fact, he's the least in the family. And then he says, and well, God, you know, you haven't saved us from the Midianites so far. So how can I believe or trust that you're going to help us now? You know, fear caused him to question and to doubt God's ability to do more than his people could ever, ever do on their own. So God offers Gideon reassurance that he'll give him what he needs to strike down every single Midianite. But apparently that's not enough for Gideon. So this story actually goes from like chapter 6 of Judges into, well into chapter 7. I didn't want you to have to stand for 20 minutes and read the passage. So I'm going to just summarize for you uh, what that is. God gives Gideon the thumbs up of protection and success. And Gideon says to him, I find this to be what my grandmother would call audacity. Oh, okay, well, let me just test you to see if, this is what you really, really say you're going to do. And he doesn't do it once. He does it twice. But he does finally come around. He concedes, though he is still doubtful and still full of fear. And God tells him now, well, I'm going to handpick 3,000 men. Yeah, I said 3,000. 3,000 men to go against the Midianites, 300,000. Here's where Gideon really has to give up fear and trust in God's plan. Now, if we continue to examine the life of Gideon, you can see how really scared he is. And yet, despite his fears and obstinately testing God, he presses on and obeys. And ultimately, what he finds is an army more than 10 times the size of his own who in great fear turn and run the other direction once Gideon and his men get there and do what God has asked him to do. Gideon had to change himself and his views. In other words, give up his fears in order to complete the work God was giving him to do. He had to realize that living in a state of fear of his calling was only inhibiting the work set before him and the victory that God was promising and assuring. Now, many times the ways of God seem to make absolutely no sense. I mean, sometimes there seems to be no rhyme or reason to why God does the things he does. Yet, the more that we trust in God, the more likely we will be able to overcome our fear of following him wherever he leads, both personally and corporately. God asks us to do scary things sometimes because he wants us to trust him more and more each day. He wants us to obey and obedience to God is all about trust in God. You see, the enemy's agenda is to keep us from obeying God and seeking his desired changes for the kingdom by attacking our thought processes with fear and judgment, hopelessness, desolation, discouragement, confusion, etc. There are a vast number of people out in our very own community right now 
that are experiencing these things. When we fear change, it keeps us in here and it keeps others from knowing what we know, that they have not been forsaken or abandoned, that they are loved and cherished beyond anything they could possibly ever imagine, no matter what they have done. Do you view people out there as an interruption of what you do in here? Or do you view them as lost sheep needing a shepherd? They will never know about Jesus unless we step out of our comfort zones and go meet them where they are. And part of that journey is us realizing that every one of us has a purpose, a destiny, and a calling in life. We need to trust God to determine that purpose, lead us toward our destiny, and all the while we should be answering the call to be all God intended us to be. For most of us, that is a lifetime of changing and evolving. Fear of change is what allows the enemy to get you to compromise your calling. Compromise who God intended you to be, who God intended us as a church to be. You'll become ineffective as the body of Christ. You'll be ineffective as witnesses of the love of Jesus and the good news of the gospel that is for every single human being on this earth. Sadly, we often act like the good news is only available if you step onto our campus and into these doors. When we are supposed to be missionally witnessing and bringing change for the kingdom. We can't do that entirely in these walls. <laughs> Forgot the word I was gonna use. I know you've heard me use this acronym before, but I think it bears repeating when we're talking about this subject, F-E-A-R, false evidence appearing real. Fear is the enemy's most powerful tool against us because it gets us to abandon the changes God puts before us that would bring more and more people to know the love of Jesus and the promises of the God who will never abandon us even when we test him and ask him to prove himself over and over again. Fear not only robs us of life on a personal level, but it robs us of the opportunity that God is calling us to take, which is helping others to see the love of Jesus by allowing them to get to know us. So I want to take a look now um, at 2 Corinthians. We're going to look at chapter 5, verses 14 to 20. This passage is going to help remind us what, 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 what Paul told us um, that we want to see that Jesus leads us forward, away from fear, into his arms, and then into taking our place as ambassadors of change for the glory of the kingdom. Hear God's word. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. All this from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. 
I'm going to call a spade a spade here. The church, big C, as the church, big C, we're definitely afraid. And it is at the expense of becoming Christ's ambassadors. And here's the thing. If you want to make change, you need to rely on God for that guidance. If you truly want to make change for the better, for the kingdom, rely on God to show you through his Holy Spirit your God-given purpose individually and as a church. Then serve others and never look back. But we can't do that from inside the sanctuary or our fellowship halls with only our tightly knit church family. I can't tell you how many times I have worked with churches over the last few years as they've sought a new pastor and people come up and pose the question, how is he going to bring people in here? The fact is, the gospel is not about bringing people in here, and it certainly isn't your pastor's sole responsibility to go out into the streets and witness the good news. It's the responsibility of the body of Christ, which is all of us, to do this work together. Share the grace and the mercy we have experienced in our lives Assure others, just like God did with Gideon, that they will be saved and God will do a new thing with them, in them too. Change can be scary and can bring about a multitude of fears, I know. It's hard because it brings uncertainty and it can bring pain. It means we may not be in control of everything all the time. As a matter of fact, Mark Twain said the only person who likes change is a wet baby. <laughs> now think about MPC. How scary is change for you here at our church? In this place, at this particular time. We must learn to let go of our fear and lean upon God to find the new life that comes through change. You know, when Paul wrote... Uh, his letters to the Corinthians, he recognized that they were in need of change. And in our larger Presbyterian denomination, we all also recognize that we can, and we, as a matter of fact, do change. We declare Ecclesia Reformata Semper Reformandum Secundum Verbum Dei. I did that just to see what Donnie signed because, you know, I didn't want to give her something really difficult like this from last week. It means the church reformed, always to be reformed, according to the word of God. One way we overcome the fear of change is to recognize that it is needed. It's to recognize that obedience to God will involve change. Obedience involves trust, and trust means we let go of fear of change. So what does that mean for us as a church, as followers of Jesus? How do we move forward and embrace change to make it so the people we don't know, who may not be anything like us, will want to know what we know and do what we do? Well, first we have to be on board with the knowledge that embracing change is good. God is continually doing a new thing in us and through us. And as we reform our state and outdated practices and ways, we open the door to allowing the new to come in. That doesn't mean that we're abandoning who we are and all the traditions we have established, but it means finding new ways to draw in the generations of people who have put up the Joan Rivers talk to the hand I know that prospects can incite a level of fear deep down inside or imagine the excitement it can create for moving into a new era with great leadership that will edify the kingdom for the glory of God. My friends, the choice is always ours. We are really good at one-off relationships with people who aren't part of our inner circle, 
But what Jesus is calling us to do is to engage in long-term relationships. We need to remember that God is continually transforming this world into something beautiful, always. The people who don't know this need to see his beauty. They aren't going to find it when they're out there and we're in here. And it's unfortunate because we, the church, Big C again, often act like the Department of Immigration. We wait for people to come to us, then we arduously process them towards the goal of citizenship. And in so doing, we lose the heart and soul of acting like Jesus did during his ministry, which was welcoming, welcoming them to him, no matter who they were, wherever they were. My friends, people are longing, longing to have an encounter with the living God right now, today. Are you? I've been so blessed to be able to um, have deep conversations uh, with a group of Gen Zers and millennials over the last year or so. And what they're telling me is they want to know if the God of the universe is real and alive and they want to experience who he is. Do you? They want to know who this Jesus guy really is. Not my words. They want to know if what we have is available to them. And they are in desperate need of us to fill in the blanks. I don't know where you are in your journey. That may be you too. And those may be your questions. And if they are, as believers in the living God, we can answer them with testimonials from our own lives. God is changing the world. And we are called to be his ambassadors of that change. And I know this is where fear steps in and prevents us from doing the missional work of the kingdom. Fear shuts us off from participating in God's mission of loving others. Fear makes us inward focused, isolating us from the world around us and removing us from God's plan to bring the good news to the world. My friends, Jesus was the number one ambassador, the original ambassador. He came down from heaven and faced heartache, betrayal, and death in order to reconcile all mankind to him. His ministry was not in the temple, but out on the streets of the villages that he and the disciples walked during his three-year ministry. We need to walk those streets too. But that requires change on our part which can be unsettling. We can deny that we need it. We'll have to face the reality of the inside and the outside of the church, and we'll have to let go. Like Gideon, sometimes we are afraid of people, places, and things, only to discover they are actually more afraid of us than we are of them. My friends, we serve a God of love and of life. But we cannot experience that love or that life if all we do is hang on to things that are dead. Fear is a life-sucking liar. We have to let go of our fears. We have to let go of all of the excuses we make about why we can't change. Think about it this way. I, no, you guys know what metamorphosis is. It's the scientific term for change or transformation. And the most obvious example is that of the caterpillar, right? And he goes into a cocoon and comes out, comes out sometime later as a butterfly. What if the caterpillar decided he was afraid of the dark? Or if the caterpillar decided that he was claustrophobic and the thought of being cooped up in a cocoon was just too much to handle, 
so he doesn't go and wrap himself in that cocoon. That's going to be it, right? Within a short matter of time, the caterpillar will die. And even if he lives for a while, he will never become a beautiful butterfly. He will never make that amazing change because he's scared. Here's what we need to remember in the midst of any change, no matter our fears or where we are on our journey. God is with us. God wants a relationship with us. And he's ready to bring about transformational changes in our lives and the life of the church. It's a message that other people need to hear. We have to learn to rest in God's presence and lean upon God's strength in the face of change. We have to turn our fears over to God and in faith move forward. Change is not something to be avoided. It is the thing we need to embrace. And we have to move from a mindset of us, them, to we. Friends, we've got to break up with our fears. Fear doesn't own you. There's no room in the story for fear. Tell the enemy there's no room in our story for fear. Tell fear it is not welcome here anymore. This is your call from God. Slam the door in the face of fear and be part of his amazing, transformational, life-giving changes as his ambassadors of the good news to our world. Let's pray. Lord, send your Holy Spirit to transform us from creatures of abject fear into people joyously spreading the good news, unconditionally loving our communities, welcoming all your children, and being who you have called us to be, fearless ambassadors of change. Amen. All right, I'm going to invite you to stand. Sick and tired of being sick and tired. Had as much of you as I can take. I'm so done, so over being afraid.
just like me. Anybody needn't fear to leave. If you don't know how to say it, sing along with me. hear you singing. Let me tell you, that's something. Could you hear them singing? Yep. They were singing loud, weren't they? So you guys are on board with getting rid of fear. Whether it's your personal life or the church, it's something that we need to do. Personally, if you have fears, I know somebody you can talk to. He's he's on vacation, staycation. That's why he's not preaching today. But go to Kenan, who's up here to pray. And I guess Debbie Lee is supposed to come up and pray too. So at the end, give your fears up to them. Let them give it up to God. In my grief support group, we have a, a worry fear bag. And we write down what they are. And we put them in the bag as a, as a semblance of giving them up to God. Go home and get a little paper lunch bag. And post it. And do that. Give your fears up to God. Then come back here week after week and be part of this church and part of the change that we need to make in the community. Support the visions of Keenan in our session because there are people out there that don't know who Jesus is. They don't have what we have. And I can tell you from those conversations with the Gen Zers, there, that's just an example, because there's more than just them out there, but people want to know who God is. So receive this blessing. May the Lord, who loved us before we loved him, the Lord who looks down upon us, puts his hands on us to rid us of fear, wraps us in his arms of comfort and peace, May he bless you and keep you as you go through the rest of this week, giving up your fears to him. Have a great day. <laughs>